Welcome to the ninth episode of The Real Crisis in Cosmology. I'm Eric Lerner, Chief Scientist at LPP Fusion. There has been so much bad news lately for the Big Bang hypothesis that, frankly, we've had trouble keeping up with it. In our last episode, we reported on the May 27th announcement that the predictions of the CMB theory of the Big Bang were off according to the Dark Energy Survey. Just 10 days later, on June 7th, other scientists reported at an Astronomical Society meeting on a 3 billion light year long arc in the sky. We'll let Dr. Lopez explain it for herself. We have found a giant arc of magnesium-2 absorbers corresponding to a large-scale structure of galaxies. The giant arc spans 3.3 billion light years, which is almost three times the theoretical threshold. And it's also amongst several other large-scale structures, indicating a potential challenge to the standard model. So, as we said back in episode three, there are structures in the universe that are so large they wouldn't have had time to form in the 14 billion years since the Big Bang hypothetically occurred. This is one of those objects. And it's not the only one. Other scientists have reported other large-scale structures that conflict with the basic hypotheses of the Big Bang. Dr. Seacrest and colleagues report on a study of 1.36 million quasars that indicate they are not homogenous on the sky. Our results, they say, are in conflict with the cosmological principle, a foundational assumption of the concordance lambda CDM model. In their first sentence, they explain, the standard Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker, FLRW, Cosmology is based on the cosmological principle, which posits that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. Well, the FLRW model is simply a scientific way of saying the Big Bang hypothesis, which was developed by Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, and Walker. And it was Abbe Georges Lemaitre, who was the first to hypothesize this gigantic explosion and the expansion of the universe, even though at that time it wasn't called the Big Bang. Now, this model only predicts a expansion based on Einstein's theory of general relativity with the additional assumptions that the universe is homogeneous the same at every point, and isotropic, the same in all directions, on large enough scales. So by homogeneous, we mean it looks the same at every point. So for example, if you're in a universe that looks like this stack of bricks, it would be homogeneous, but it wouldn't be isotropic, because there would be special directions in the direction in which the bricks are stacked. If you were in a universe that looked like the star, then you would, at the center of that star, look outward, and the universe would be isotropic, the same in all directions. But if you moved to a different place, it wouldn't look the same. So in one case, we have hom homogeneity. In the other case, we have isotropic. But the universe they hypothesize on a large enough scale must be both homogeneous and isotropic. Well, the interesting thing was that at the time this theory was formulated, there was absolutely no observational evidence that the universe was homogeneous and isotropic. Astronomers in the early part of the 20th century looked out and they saw most of the matter in the universe was concentrated either into our Milky Way galaxy, which anyone in a sufficiently dark sky can see is in a narrow strip across the sky, 
or in other similar galaxies. So it wasn't at all isotropic or homogenous. They just, on philosophical, not scientific grounds, hypothesized that on large enough scales, this would be the case. Well, in the decades that passed, as more and more powerful telescopes were developed, astronomers looked out, and as they looked deeper into space, they saw larger and larger structures, larger and larger inhomogeneities and anisotropies, which contradicted the theory. Now, that's OK as long as it converges on the largest scales. Well, what are the largest scales? Due to the amount of time since the Big Bang was hypothesized to have happened, there must be hom homogeneity and isotropic universe on scales larger than about a billion light years. Well, these recent discoveries and the many other discoveries we pointed out back in episode three point to objects that are at least three, four, or even five times larger than this limit. This is exactly what the arc in the sky shows, an object far larger than a billion light years across. The arc sort of looks like a smile. Maybe the galaxies are laughing at the Big Bang theoreticians that say such objects can't exist. So the Big Bang hypothesis is in trouble. Now, people tend to exaggerate when they're reporting on this, and I've seen headlines, physics overturned, physics in trouble, Einstein is wrong. Well, the fact of the matter is, physics is not in trouble. It's the Big Bang hypothesis that's in trouble. You don't have to worry about airplanes falling out of the sky more than they do, because aircraft are held up by our understanding of aerodynamics. Our understanding of aerodynamics doesn't change whether or not the Big Bang happened. OK, I need, I need to force quit the program because this is not. And your computer won't crash any more than it does, because the hardware that your computer runs on is based on our understanding of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics won't change whether or not the Big Bang happened. It's like, oh, it's frozen. And our sagging need of repair grid will not go down any more frequently. I think, I think it's crashed again, maybe. Because the grid and our use of electricity is based on our understanding of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And that won't change whether or not the Big Bang happened. So if you sort of look at a map of uh, physics, and uh, thanks to Mr. Wallman for making this map, the hypotheses that go into the Big Bang theory are separated from the rest of physics. And if the Big Bang is wrong, then those hypotheses will sort of safely disappear into the chasm of ignorance. Of course, we'll be missing some imaginary entities that would be eliminated if we realize the Big Bang never happened. We'll have to get rid of inflation, dark matter, dark energy, dark forces. What it comes right down to is that the Big Bang is a hypothetical historical event which did not occur, like other non-existent historical events, like the victory of the slave-holding Southern Confederacy in the U.S. Civil War, or the election of Donald J. Trump in 2020. Now, we know there are lots of folk, like this fellow, who think that these events did happen, but that doesn't mean that they did. So at this point, let's get back to what we were discussing in episode eight. And in future episodes, we will discuss in greater detail the whole inhomogeneity evidence that people have come up with. But right now, what we want to look at is more of the evidence from the cosmic microwave background 
that the Big Bang theory of this microwave background is not right. And one of the things the theory predicts, of course, is that the microwave background is isotropic. If you look at this map of the small fluctuations, small in amplitude, in the intensity of the cosmic microwave background radiation, you'll see that it's not quite symmetrical. The blue and red fluctuations on the right-hand side of the drawing are bigger, more intense, than those on the left-hand side. And the line that separates them is the ecliptic. That's the plane of our own solar system. Now that's really weird from a Big Bang standpoint because this radiation is supposed to be coming from billions of light years away, not from inside our own solar system. Well, of course, you could say that they're separated as well by that vertical line, which is the north-south axis of our own Milky Way galaxy. But again, the Milky Way is supposed to be far, far smaller than where this radiation is coming from. So this is a really big contradiction. And scientists look at this in terms of spherical modes. Now, spherical modes are just a way of divvying up the sky as if it was the surface of a sphere. So if you have a spherical mode 20, you're divvying up the sky into 20 different patches, like in the little diagram here. So if you plot the amount of fluctuation against these various modes, what scientists found out was the amount of fluctuation was bigger in the southern hemisphere of the sky than in the northern hemisphere. So this chart, which admittedly is a little hard to follow, shows that the dotted line is the amount of fluctuation in the southern hemisphere of the sky at various modes. The solid line is the amount of fluctuation in the northern hemisphere. And you can see very consistently the southern hemisphere has more fluctuation than the northern hemisphere. In some cases, two or three times as much. So this is a very strong contradiction of the hypothesis of isotropy. Perhaps even more curious is that if you divvy up the sphere into an odd number of uh, segments, so that's an odd mode, three, five, seven, you get more fluctuations than if you give it divvy up into an even mode. So to summarize, if you put all the evidence we've been putting forward and other people have been putting forward that we've described in episode eight and episode nine, you get the following conclusions. The cosmic microwave background overall is smooth and isotropic to a level of 0.001%. Now that was not predicted by the original form of the Big Bang Theory, but is predicted by the current inflationary model. However, the small fluctuations in brightness are not random as predicted by the current Big Bang inflationary theory. And they are not isotropic, equal in all di directions. These contradictions are evident on the largest angular scales on the sky. So that's where we stand with these contradictions to the Big Bang Theory of the Cosmic Microwave Background. In the next episode, we'll wind up these contradictions, discuss these new uh, discoveries of inhomogeneities, and in the episode after that, we'll finally get to what the real story is behind the Cosmic Microwave Background, how it could have come into existence without a big bang.
In the meantime, visit wefunders LTC Fusion, where you can invest in fusion research. If you can't support the research by investing directly, subscribe to any of the links below. Share, like us, tune in, and thanks for watching.